Nowhere in the country does the excitement of college football reach a higher pitch than in the Southeastern Conference. It's a conference deeply steeped in the traditions of winning teams, successful coaches, and outstanding players. The SEC does a lot more than just hold its own in intersectional competition. It long has been recognized as a national leader. This was true again in 1972, with four of its teams ranked in the top 12 in the nation. 1973, the coming season, is rich in promise. Yes, the SEC has it all when it comes to college football, upsets, highly ranked teams, great coaches, and All-American players. I'm Bill Fleming, and this is the story of Southeastern Conference football. Presented by Kmart. All the things a great store should be. The Southeastern Conference plays a balanced game of football, strong on the attack and strong on defense. On offense, the key man is the quarterback. So let's take a look now at some of the SEC's best from last season, most of whom will return this fall. All-American Burt Jones of Louisiana State University threw for 14 touchdowns, and many people regarded number seven of LSU as the best player in the nation. Sophomore Melvin Barkham, number 14 of Mississippi State, showed that he could improvise like a veteran, converting this bad snap on a field goal attempt into a touchdown. He'll be a tailback for State this coming fall. At Alabama, jersey number 10 belonged to Terry Davis, voted the SEC's most valuable player in 1972. He's been in the middle of Alabama's wishbone attack for the past three years, and the Crimson Tide fans are sorry to see Terry leave after a brilliant career. Dinky McKay of Kentucky averaged eight completed passes per game in 1972, and the Wildcat fans are most happy that he's returning in 73. Although only a junior at Mississippi, Norris Weiss, number 16, led the league in total offense. He'll lead Ole Miss again this fall. Condridge Holloway of Tennessee, number seven, completed better than 60% of his passes last year, and great things were expected from him in 73. Andy Johnson, number 14, who returns at Georgia, is a fine passer, and he's also regarded as a very strong runner. David Bowden, number five of Florida, while only a sophomore, led the SEC in pass completions and passing yardage in 1972. He should be ready for a fine season in 73. So much for the quarterbacks. On the defensive line, the SEC always has the men who can make the big play. It had them last season, and it will have them again this fall. Here's Florida's Ricky Brown, number 50, dumping the quarterback. And this is his teammate, David Hitchcock, number 66. Both will be back this season. Vanderbilt tackle, Mark Ilgenfritz, number 77, collars a runner behind the line. Jack Hall, number 84 of Mississippi State, applies the pressure and forces a bad pass. One good reason for Tennessee's defensive reputation was Carl Johnson, number 59. Danny Sandsbury, Auburn's number 93, was voted an all-conference defensive end for his ability to follow the ball. Alabama's John Mitchell, number 97, shows why he was named as an All-America selection. The 
job of the receiver demands a wide variety of skills. And Nat Moore, number 39, who returns at Florida, has them all. Teammate Willie Jackson, number 22, shows how to pull in a touchdown pass. Tennessee's Eamon Love, number 85, was one of the fastest men in the conference. Always dangerous. Mississippi State had the conference's leading receiver in Bill Buckley, number 24. He's also back. Sophomore Brad Boyd, number 89, was one of LSU's fine core of receivers. Ole Miss has an all-conference end in Butch Beasy, number 85. Scoring here, one of his eight touchdowns. He could have a great season in 73. Jack Alvarez will be one of Kentucky's top receivers again this year. The offensive machine of Alabama again will be fueled by players like Wayne Wheeler, number 82, who was an all-league selection. Great linebacking has long been an SEC trademark, and the returning crop is one of the best in history. This is Florida's Ralph Ortega, number 55. Tennessee's Eddie Wilson, number 54, illustrates the basic tackle. While this interception shows why teammate Jamie Rotella, number 57, was an All-American. John David Calhoun, number 50 of Mississippi State, turns a completed pass into a loss. Mississippi's linebackers team up. Bob Bayless, number 41, blocks a punt, and Keith McKay, number 47, recovers it. LSU's defensive unit again will be led by All-American linebacker Warren Capone, number 55. Now watch number 40, Mike Neal of Auburn, fighting off a blocker and bringing down the passer. The SEC always has the running backs with power and speed. Here's Nat Moore of Florida, one of the very best in the nation. Chris Stanton, number 32 of LSU, finds a hole, makes a fake, and has 20 yards. Wayne Jones, number 32, who returns at Mississippi State, picks up the tough yardage. Steve Berger, number 10, had an outstanding and versatile career in the Vanderbilt backfield. Chris Linderman, number 29, will make the Auburn backfield strong again this season. Last year, Linderman teamed up with Terry Henley, number 23, the league's leading rusher. Henley ground out most of his yardage on tough, short runs like this. Tennessee's Haskell Standback, number 24, scored a total of 13 touchdowns last season to lead the league, and he returns. When things get rough, the Georgia Bulldogs will hand the ball to Jimmy Poulos, number 20. Greg Ainsworth, number 25, was the top runner for the Ole Miss Rebels in 72. Sonny Collins, number 40, attracted a lot of attention at Kentucky, where he was only a freshman last year. Alabama did the most rushing in the league in 72 and will be led again by Wilbur Jackson, who averaged more than seven yards per carry. And rounding out those runners, Steve Bichelia, number 44, who scored nine touchdowns last year for the Tide. The toughest place on the field to play may very well be at defensive back. Florida's Tyson Seaver, number 21, will be making great defensive plays for the Gators again this fall. Mickey Fratizzi, number 26, blitzes for Mississippi, and he's back. Vanderbilt had the best pass defense in the nation last year, counting heavily on Tommy Tompkins, number 16, here causing a fumble. A super defender for Auburn is David Langner, number 28, who scored two touchdowns and intercepted eight passes. Alabama.
Graham as Bobby McKinney, number 26. Earned a place on the All-SEC team with his quick play. Another defensive back named All-American was Frank Dowsick, number 40, of Mississippi State. Tennessee had an All-American in Conrad Graham, number 37. He led a defense which yielded only seven and a half points per game. And now let's talk about the offensive line, which oftentimes goes largely unnoticed, but it holds the key to the attack. The SEC always seems to have its share of good offensive lines. Center Jim Crow, number 54, and right guard John Hanna, number 73, were recognized as two important reasons for Alabama's gaining over 400 yards per game. Both were All-Americans. Auburn's Mac Lorendo was an all-conference offensive tackle. Florida sophomore Mike Stanfield, number 77, shows how to open a hole. As any student of football knows, the kicking game determines the outcome of many a contest. Tennessee's Ricky Townsend scored 67 points last year to earn All-America honors as a junior. His style is certainly unique. Toes taped together, barefoot style. Sure is effective. The balls have now made 91 straight points after touchdown for an NCAA record. Yes, kicking is important, but so is returning those kicks. Eddie Brown, number 25 of Tennessee, returned punts for 429 yards to lead the lead. Florida's Tyson Seaver, number 21, was an accomplished artist in fielding and returning punts. Great players play great games, and the 1972 Southeastern Conference schedule saw some of the most exciting and close games ever. We'll take a look at some of them. The story of SEC football in 1972 began on September the 30th, when Tennessee traveled to Birmingham's Legion Field to take on Auburn. The War Eagles scored first when Terry Henley went in for the touchdown. Gardner Jett booted a 25-yard field goal to make it 10 to nothing in favor of Auburn, and the Auburn fans went wild. Tennessee got right back in the game when junior quarterback Gary Valbuena found Chip Howard open and he takes it in for six. Auburn's defensive unit was forced to dig in. David Langner, who has a knack for being in the right place at the right time, picked off this pass to break the Volunteers' momentum and Auburn held on to win a thriller, 10 to six. On the same afternoon, just a few hundred miles to the east, the University of Florida was playing host to Mississippi State. State scored first when quarterback Melvin Barkham pitched out to Lewis Grubbs. Gator coach Doug Dickey showed his concern. But in the third quarter, with Florida trailing 13 to seven, Vince Kendrick, number 20, broke loose and put the Gators in the lead for keeps. The final score of that one Florida 28, Mississippi State 13. Tennessee and 72,000 fans welcomed Alabama to Knoxville, hoping to end the Crimson Tide's undefeated streak. But John Mitchell, number 97, and John Coyle, number 83, led a strong Alabama defensive effort. And Terry Davis, number 10, pulled Alabama through 17 to 10 on this run with less than 60 seconds to play. The 1972 SEC Highlights brought to you by Kmart continues now. We move into late October in Lexington and the game between Georgia and Kentucky. Kentucky sophomore Steve Phillips, number 27, ran this punt back, setting up a Wildcat touchdown. Bulldog coach Vince Dooley looking on as Jimmy Paulus ties up the game. 
Jim Braswell went on to kick two field goals to give Georgia the win, 13 to seven. One of the greatest rivalries in the Southeastern Conference is between LSU and Mississippi. The Tigers hosted the Rebels in Baton Rouge. Coach Charlie McClendon was relying on quarterback Burt Jones to preserve LSU's undefeated season. But that streak appeared to be at an end, with LSU behind 16 to 10, with only one second to go on the clock. This was one of those unbelievable moments in college football. Burt Jones dropped back, then threw for the corner, where sophomore Brad Davis somehow caught the ball to score. Absolutely incredible. The score was tied with no time showing on the clock. LSU set up for the extra point, and now all of the pressure was on sophomore Rusty Jackson. He kicked it, and it was good. And LSU won a thriller never to be forgotten by one point. Kentucky took the field against Vanderbilt in the last game to be played at Stoll Field. This was the site of the first football game ever played in the southeastern United States back in 1880. It will be replaced by a 52,000-seat stadium. Early in the game, Walt Overton caught a Steve Lanehart pass to give Vandy the lead. Steve Berger carried the ball in for a second Vanderbilt score. Freshman Doug Sexton had kept Kentucky in the game by kicking two field goals. Trailing 13 to six early in the fourth quarter, Dinky McKay puts Kentucky into scoring position with this toss to Ken O'Leary, number 16. A few plays later, Sonny Collins bowls his way in for the touchdown, and then he added to his role as the hero by going in for the final two points to give Kentucky a 14 to 13 victory. Two undefeated teams met before a national TV audience when Louisiana State challenged Alabama. And two of the Southeastern Conference's best quarterbacks squared off against each other. Burt Jones threw for two touchdown passes and scored on this run. And Alabama's Terry Davis also threw for two touchdowns and scored on this run. But the Crimson Tide, which led the conference in both total offense and defense, overpowered LSU by a score of 35 to 21. Another rough game for Louisiana State was the struggle with Florida in a heavy rainstorm. The rain made offensive play especially difficult, but the Gators' Bobby Bowden got off this pass to Nat Moore. Strangely enough, the best offensive play of the day also contained the best defensive play because the Tigers' Mike Williams, number 29, pulled Moore down on the three-yard line. And so this rain-soaked classic wound up in a three-to-three -three tie. One of the great rivalries in all of college football is the game between Alabama and Auburn. The two coaches, Shug Jordan of Auburn and Bear Bryant of Alabama, tell what it's like. There's nothing like the Auburn-Alabama game. Well, actually, all the games are big games for us, but uh, I think the Auburn game, since it's our cross-state rival, is, is always a big one. The school's alumni have been married. It's a family brawl, in other words. Not a brawl, perhaps, but a family contest. The competition is keen. of all the tradition and rivalry of other games, none can compare with this intrastate rivalry between Auburn and Alabama. The game more than lived up to its promise. The fourth quarter was to produce some of the year's most thrilling moments. As Bear Bryant looked on confidently, Alabama prepared to punt, leading the game 16-3. But Auburn's Bill Newton, number 56, blocked the punt, and David Langer scooped it up and went in for the score. It's hard to believe, but minutes later, Newton blocked a second Alabama punt, and you guessed it, Langer picked it up and scored a second touchdown. With Auburn handing Alabama its only loss of the regular season, 17-16.
The Southeastern Conference long has been the country's most prolific producer of bowl teams. Two SEC teams, Tennessee and LSU, met in the Astro Blue Bonnet Bowl in Houston. Coaches Bill Battle of the Balls and Charlie McClendon of LSU brought two of the league's best defensive teams into that game. But it quickly turned into an offensive battle with Tennessee's Conbridge Holloway, number seven, finding Jimmy Young open at the goal line. Then Holloway showed why he's an All-American prospect for 73 by running it in from the 15. And again in the second quarter, he raced 10 yards for a score. Tennessee led 24 to three. But LSU came back. And in the second half, Mike Williams returned this punt deep into Tennessee territory. A few plays later, Burt Jones on a keeper got LSU's first touchdown. In the fourth quarter, Jones handed off to sophomore Brad Davis, number 48, who gave LSU six more points. And the Tigers had come alive. Trailing now by only 24 to 17 on the Tennessee 22 yard line, Jones threw a crucial fourth down pass. But Conrad Graham, number 37, Tennessee's All-American, knocked the pass down and time ran out on LSU. Tennessee won and Bill Battle enjoyed the victory. The Cotton Bowl Classic pitted Alabama against Texas. Both were wishbone offense teams, both were conference champions, and both were led by top coaches in Bear Bryant and Darrell Roy. Alabama scored first on a Bill Davis field goal. Texas took to the air, but Steve Wade, number 32, picked off the pass for the Crimson Tide and returned it to the Texas 31. From there, Wilbur Jackson took a pitch out, set a couple of good blocks, and went all the way. Alabama led 10 to three at this point, but from there on, Texas came on strong to win 17 to 13. Auburn went up against a highly regarded Colorado team in the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. A national TV audience watched as the War Eagles defense, led by Danny Sansbury, number 93, continually held Colorado's powerful offense in check. Another surprise was the performance of sophomore Wade Whatley, number 15, in his first starting assignment. Throwing to Terry Henley and then taking the ball in himself, he led Auburn to its first touchdown. In the third quarter, Auburn scored again as Mike Fuller, number 20, faked the end run and then pass deep to Rob Spivey, number 86, who made a fine grab in the end zone. The final score was 24 to three, as Auburn stunned the Buffaloes, and Coach Shug Jordan displayed his happiness. Honey? When you fellows are through there, could we run over to Kmart? Oh, okay, dear. <laughs> I don't know what she needs, but there's a lot of things I can look at. Practically everything in the garage came from Kmart. The lawnmower, my tools, the tennis racket, Bobby's new football helmet, the grill, my new golf clubs, even the paint. Come on, let's go! While 1972 was a big year for the 10 teams of the Southeastern Conference, 1973 holds even greater promise. As we've indicated, many talented players return for the new season. SEC champion Alabama will have back receiver Wayne Wheeler, defensive lineman John Croyle, and runner Wilbur Jackson, number 80. 
Kentucky will count on defensive back Steve Phillips, number 27, and offensive stars Dinky McKay, Jack Alvarez, and Sonny Collins. At Georgia, quarterback Andy Johnson, number 14, leads the backfield, which also includes Jimmy Poulos. Matt Moore, number 39, is back for Florida, along with David Bowden and Tyson Seaver. Vanderbilt has defender Tommy Tompkins and receivers Walt Overton and Doug Martin, number 82. LSU looks to runner Brad Davis, number 48, and Warren Capone and Mike Williams on defense. Auburn should be strong with Wade Watley, number 15, and Chris Linderman and defensive ace David Langer returning. Norris Weiss, number 16, will be running the offensive show for Ole Miss, and he'll be looking for Ann Butch Beasy. Mississippi State's offense has Tommy Strahan, number 87, Melvin Barkham, and receiver Bill Buckley. Conbridge Holloway, Bill Rudder, number 36, and Haskell Stanback give Tennessee a strong backfield. Those are just a few of the outstanding players who will be on the field for SEC teams this season. They'll combine with the league's core of top coaches, including new head coaches, Steve Sloan at Vanderbilt, Fran Kersey at Kentucky, and Bob Tyler at Mississippi State. No wonder, millions of fans once again will be seeing SEC football in 1973. These 1972 Southeastern Conference football highlights have been brought to you by Kmart, where you get quality at discount prices.